So today we are concluding our series, Arguing with Jesus. So after today, there's no more arguing with Jesus, all right? <laughs> We've actually looked at people who got into an argument with Jesus, what he was willing to argue about, who he was willing to argue with, and how he handled those arguments. And the first one was, had to do with human relationships, even in the afterlife. The second argument had to do with uh, what rules were most important. Last week, we, we saw that Jesus actually got engaged in a political argument. And this week, uh, we're going to look at uh, an argument that Jesus got in about Jesus. Arguing with Jesus about Jesus. It says in, in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, while the Pharisees gathered together, Jesus asked them. Now, it looks like Jesus is initiating this conversation, but the last verse we'll read actually says that they did not ask him any more questions, which means he's simply responding to a question they asked with a question. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my feet. If David calls him Lord... How can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Perfect message to end the Arguing with Jesus series on no more questions. <laughs> so I think all of us uh, have, have two things that tend to be true about us if we're in the faith journey. One is, is we want to be convinced that what we believe is true, and we want to help convince others that what we believe is true. And it's not just about feeling better if more people accept what we think. It's just this idea that the grace of God is so transformative in our own lives, we would very much like other people to experience that kind of transformation in their own life. And so uh, the conversation obviously has to do with, you know, are you really the Messiah or not? And he said, well, whose, whose son would the Messiah be? Uh, the reason Jesus starts here is because in a traditional society, the ancestors always hold higher honor than the people who live now or the people who are coming. So you wouldn't refer to someone later as Lord. It would always be the predecessor that was Lord. And he says, so if, if the Messiah is the son of David, why does David refer to him as Lord? And it may seem like an insignificant thing to us. And the point that Jesus is making is that you're wrong. The point is that Jesus is making is the way you are thinking about this is too limited. You have ideas about the Messiah that actually are too small, and the result is, is that you'll miss a lot. And so Jesus uses this passage to try to open their thinking a little bit. So how is it possible that David would be referring to the Messiah as Lord if it's his son? There's, there's two, things I, two ways I think people like to be convinced or wish they were. And, and the first is this. We would like to see a miracle that was so powerful and so overruled the laws of nature that we would just be convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt, yeah, God is real. This is true. That's just the way it is. Except what I've discovered is, is that when we are confronted with the miraculous, we do not tend to believe it. We tend to question it all the more. Uh, for example, uh, just about a year ago, there was a young man in our church uh, uh, in, in school who walked onto a soccer field, collapsed. He uh, crashed and coded multiple times. They had him on a heart and lung machine. And we all prayed for him. And tomorrow, he will step on the soccer field for the first time since then. And he's been around you. You didn't notice anything about him. Because, you know, yeah. And, and some of us are going, yay, God. And some of us are going, yeah, how do you know he wouldn't have got better anyway? Right? That's what we do. Or there's a little girl... The statistics of her survival at birth were terrifyingly small. And uh, I, think, I think every believer in the world actually prayed for this little girl. It was the best networked prayer chain I've ever seen in my life. And she just celebrated her second birthday a little over a week ago. Yeah. And, and so some of us go, yes, that's a miracle. And some of us go, eh, you know. It, it's not like 100% of the babies who are born with that die, so maybe she's in that percentage. And we want to be confronted with power 
that overrules nature, but when we see evidence of it, we just ask more questions. We come up with more arguments. And then there's another way that we like to have things proven to us, and that's just wisdom and logic. Come up with an irrefutable line of logic so that when I hear it, I just, it decimates every doubt I will ever have. It just, just the wisdom and logic. And the assumption here is that there is an argument so powerful that it will stop you from arguing against it. So, how many married people do we have in the house? How many have experienced an argument with your spouse that was so powerful, they were so right that you just go, you're right. In fact, you're always right. <laughs> I see that hand. <laughs> And for the most part, we don't stop arguing because we know we're wrong. We stop arguing because we're tired. <laughs> Isn't that true? And, and there's always one person in the marriage that's, that has more stamina for arguing than, than the other. They don't win because they write. they're right. They win because they go longer than the other person. So We can always come up with another argument, another question. And so... The, the interesting thing is, is that when we approach our, our concept of trying to find proof about God and use these two things, we're really saying something about ourselves. The question is, what constitutes real proof? See, we've set the parameters. Well, a miracle would prove it, except it doesn't. Well, well really good logic and wisdom would, except it doesn't. We've been exposed to all of those things, and some of us still struggle. And uh, given certain circumstances, all of us will struggle. So what Jesus does in his conversation when they're arguing with him about who he is, he does something. It, it's, it's hard. It's so subtle. It's hard to pick up on. But he points them back to Scripture. Psalm 110, where David is talking about the Messiah that will come. You cannot know the truth about God apart from Scripture. You, you can be confronted with things in creation that will will start you thinking about things. But the truth that we find about God actually comes from Scripture. There are lots of people who have lots of imaginations about God. I was sitting in a barber chair quite a few years ago getting my hair cut, and uh, I have a lot of stories about this particular barber. I, I, well, I'll tell you this one. I shouldn't, it has nothing to do with the message, so don't assume anything about this. But I had been on vacation, and I don't know why it popped into my mind. I wanted to get a straight razor shave. Now, I don't know why, but I remembered as a child watching my dad lay back in the barber chair and they would put hot towels on his face and the barber would take the straight razor and run it up and down the leather strap and, and then give him a shave. My dad always talked about how that was the best shave of the whole week. And so I thought, oh, I would like to do that. And I looked all over the place that we were at for a place to get a straight razor shave and nobody would do it, which should have been included me. <laughs> and I came back home and I, and I found a guy she gave me a straight razor shave. And I said, I would like a straight razor shave. And so he, the, he leaned the chair back. He put the hot towels on. Oh, it was wonderful. He got the leather strap out and the straight razor. And I, it, was, it was so nostalgic. I, I felt like I was back in the old world again. And then he started to shave my face, and he cut my chin so bad that it bled for over a year. And he still charged me for it. So once again, that has nothing to do with the message. <laughs> and in fact, now that I've relived that moment, I've forgotten the message. <laughs> Where am I going with this? Oh, yeah. So he had... A... <laughs> if I start bleeding, let me know. <laughs> so um, he's just telling me one day, you know, well, I, I can't imagine that God would ever do this, and I think that God is like this, and I... And he, he just had so many opinions about God. And I just asked him, I said, so what's your source of information for all this opinion about God? Where did you come up with this? Where did you get it? Oh, it's, it's just what I think. Okay. Can you see the built-in challenges when we assume that our imaginations are what's true about God. There's problems built into that system. 
we need a better source of evidence. And there's actually a collection of writings called Scripture that have been collected for thousands of years that reveal unbelievable truths about God. And so Jesus just points them back to Scripture to find out who Jesus is. Study Jesus. Don't just study ideas about Jesus. Don't just study opinions about Jesus. Don't just study writings about Jesus. Look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels. How, how did Jesus act? What did Jesus do? Stop waiting for someone to argue you into understanding about God. Stop waiting for some sign that just overwhelms your sensory load and says, well, it must be God, and start actually doing the work of looking at the life of Jesus. Examine his actions, his words. Compare them with what you see in the world today. For example, Jesus was a person who had incredible authority. The constant thing that people would say about him, we've never heard anybody teach like this before. He has authority that's different. And, and he could even command wind and waves. I mean, this is a lot of authority, and yet he never used his authority to in any way demean anyone or impose his own personal preference. When have you ever seen anything like that in our world? I mean, isn't that what you do with authority? You put some people down and you get what you want. Or, or he could speak truth without actually destroying people. They felt hopeful. Or he, he walked humbly without being insecure or intimidated. Well, that's interesting. He could be certain of what he believed without being intolerant of people who didn't believe yet. He'd sit at the same table with them and both were happy for each other's company. He could be passionate without being unbalanced or unhealthy. He could be pure without living in fear that anyone less pure around him would contaminate him. He never showed prejudice. He never said anything he should not have said. He never failed to say anything he should have said. He never did anything he shouldn't have done. He never failed to do anything that he should have done. When you look at Jesus, you learn about Jesus. So Jesus brings us back to Scripture, and we're fortunate that we have the Gospels. What he's telling us is, is that God is not going to surrender to our terms for proof. That God is not going to say to us, okay, I will give you the miracle you want because he can give us the miracle that we want and it will not be enough. It doesn't stop him from doing miracles. He just knows that that's not enough. We, we look through the logic and the, and the implications of the gospel in our lives every week and, and we're not an isolated community in that regard. It happens in communities of faith and churches all over the world. And so there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of reason and a lot of logic that gets attached to our faith. And, and what God says is, there's nothing wrong with those things, but those things are not going to prove anything, and I will not limit myself to those things to prove who I am. So uh, he considers that we, he insists that we consider the proof that he offers. What's the proof that he offers? God came in the flesh. That's the proof he offers. Now, that's different than what we want, but it's what he offers. So people had ideas about the Messiah. When they said it's going to be the son of King David, they assumed that, like David, he would be a very powerful and popular leader, that he would be a brilliant military strategist and be able to command and marshal armies and have a revolt of an entire nation to overthrow the occupying force of Rome which they all hated. I mean, they really believed that, that their Messiah would do this. And here's the problem with that idea, is if you think that's what this person is going to be like, he's going to be popular, he's going to be influential, he's going to be militarily strategic, and he's going to be able to marshal forces, then the only people you will pay any attention to in your life are those who do those things. Everybody else you tune out. There's certain language you assume that a guy like that is going to use. There's a way he's going to talk. He's going to incite frustration. He's, he's going to hold uh, unjust powers accountable. He, he's, going to, he's going to recruit for military overthrow. And people were listening for that and missing the actual Messiah who was there. See, when we demand proof on our terms, we miss real information. 
And so Jesus focuses them back to what Scripture has to say. So what do you actually do when you're confronted with information that doesn't seem to, to fit the model that you've created about God or about Scripture? What do you do with something that doesn't fit in the box that you created for God to live in? It's always surprising to us. Jesus actually didn't come to fulfill our expectations because they are far too small. He came to fulfill his father's expectations. So faith does not, is not discovered by turning your brain off. This isn't a message, just stop thinking and then you'll get it. I think that's a very dangerous thing. I think God gave us a brain. He knew what he was doing. I don't think he's ever been frustrated by anyone using their brain too much. I don't think that bothers God at all. So it's not a message about not using your brain. And it's not a message about forcing everything to fit your expectations. That's not going to help you. There's, a, there's actually a lot of people who ignore whole sections of the Bible just because it doesn't fit with their predetermined criteria for what God or spirituality should look like. And so they get frustrated by that. And... Uh, it, it, the real temptation is to use the Bible to prove our point than it is to go to the Bible and let it show us its points. That's the great temptation. In fact, I was just reading a passage of Scripture this last week, and the first verse of that chapter just, I couldn't figure it out. And like, I've been doing this for a while. And I just, I said, you know, that really messes with my head. I, I don't understand that verse of Scripture. So I'm not preaching on that one this morning. Right? Why would I do that? And do you have any idea how often we just categorize and shove aside the stuff that doesn't fit in our model? And Jesus says, that's not the best way to go. He insists it's not about turning off your brain and it's not about trying to get everything to fit your expectations. It's simply about allowing God to reveal who he actually is the way he chooses to do it. And he's, Jesus is not just the son of David. He's the son of God. And, and this is the thing. When, when we have our own ideas, this is what we think. And this is what uh, they thought in the, in the, uh, when Jesus was talking to them. We still do this today. And the idea is this. You know, if, if God was really good and God was really powerful, then he would. And, and he would destroy this institution. He would, he would undo this injustice. He, he would deal with these things. And it's really fascinating to me. Every time humans come up with something that God should do, it's always dealing with a consequence of sin. And Jesus didn't come just to clean up the consequences of sin. He came to deal with the cause of sin. And so while people are waiting for him to destroy unjust institutions, he's addressing the sin that is in our heart and the death we cannot escape. That's what he's come to do. And he understands that's what makes the actual difference. So it's not wrong to believe in miracles. It's not wrong to look for a reason. But we just can't say that's the only way I can know something is true. Paul actually talked about this when he wrote to the Corinthian church. It says, Jews demand signs. That's another word for miracles. And Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. He said, we don't just do miracles so we convince the Jews and great, create great arguments for the Greeks so that they believe. He said, we preach Christ. And he said, that's a problem for the Jews. It's, it's a stumbling block to them because when you're looking for power that overrides the laws of nature, if you have that kind of power, you don't die. That's the point. So they would have a real problem with that. And then when it comes to coming with the, up with the irrefutable wisdom, wisdom and logic, the, the great stumbling block for the Greeks was that, that there would have to be a sacrifice to atone for sins. You don't make sacrifices, you just make adjustments. You get better eventually. And so what Paul says is no, nothing's really changed, right? People still want miracles and they still want wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. And to, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. It's a great passage, and what it reveals is that Jesus is not just our wisdom or our power, but he's God's wisdom, he's God's power. And the truth is, is that our doubts don't actually rise because we're confronted with information about God. 
our doubts rise when we're confronted with information about our expectations about God. So, all, and you can read these stories over and over in Scripture. Scripture never hides these kinds of stories. Uh, the church doesn't always prefer to deal with them, but the Scripture doesn't hide them. There have always been people who believed all through human history, and in their stories are included in Scripture. If I believe the right things and I do the right things, I can avoid the bad things. That's the assumption, right? If I believe the right things and I do the right things, I can avoid the bad things. And all through Scripture, people had crises of faith because they were believing the right things and they were doing the right things, but then they got arrested. Uh, then they, they, they were imprisoned because they were uh, speaking in God's name. They, they, they went into battle and, and they lost loved ones or maybe even lost their own life. The, their nation was overrun and, 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 and became enslaved. The, 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 someone got sick and they died. They were constantly confronted with all of these things that didn't go according to their plan. And their assumption was, if I believe the right things and I do the right things, I can avoid the bad things. And the problem is not God. The problem is their assumptions and their expectations of God. God didn't change for them. He's still who he has always claimed to be. It's, it's, he, he doesn't change. But we get frustrated when he doesn't meet our expectations. Our faith has to be established in something greater than just the kind of day we are having. Does that, does that make sense? So... Uh, when we focus on ourselves, we're going to be harassed by doubts. But when we start focusing on God, when we start focusing on Jesus, we begin to find that we actually are experiencing a faith that helps us face situations. In Jesus, we discover that things that seem to be incompatible actually come together. In Jesus, we see holiness and grace in the same person. In Jesus, we see truth and love in the same person. In Jesus, we see power and sacrifice. They're not mutually exclusive. They're both true in the same person. See, if our faith is too small, maybe it's because our understanding of God is too small. So we need to think these things through. Now, the last point I want to make is this, is don't require God to never offend you. That's, that's what some people use to determine what faith they're going to believe or if they're going to have any faith. Well, no, that offends me, so I can't, I can't believe in Christianity because there's things in the Bible that offend you. Jesus has always offended people Spoiler alert, they crucified him. <laughs> I've had messages that people didn't like. They just don't come back. So far, I've not been actually killed for a bad message. All right? They crucified him. Jesus was very offensive, but not because he was ungracious or because he was... He, he was mean-spirited. The thing that p offended people the most about Jesus is he had a way of disintegrating the system they had built that established their righteousness and their own salvation. And when they got around him, they realized how woefully inadequate that was, and that created a lot of fear and discomfort in them. And fear is a very close relative to anger. And so they took it out on him. Whatever we put our faith in besides Jesus will fail and whatever we pursue besides Jesus will enslave us. If we can't hear the truth that Jesus tells us about us, how are we ever going to hear the truth that he tells us about himself? He's not our power. He's not our wisdom. He's God's power, and he's God's wisdom. And maybe we could learn more about God if we tried less arguing with what Scripture says and start arguing with our assumptions about what Scripture says. So this is the last message on arguing with Jesus, but I gave you complete permission to argue with yourself. <laughs> Jesus did not come into our world to make our life easy. He came to make it full, and they are not the same thing. Jesus did not come into our world to agree with us. He came into our world to grow us into the sons and daughters of God. He has not come to eliminate our burdens. He has come to help bear them. He has not come to eliminate the need for courage. He has come to make us brave. Jesus is different than we have assumed that he is. And that difference makes all the difference in the world. The more we realize who God is and the more we realize who we have been created to be, the more we will begin to discover 
that Jesus really is the Savior of the world. Let's bow our heads today. Um, it's entirely possible that you, you're sitting in the room today because a friend invited you and, and you really don't buy into the, the whole faith thing, at least not at this point. Maybe you're interested, maybe not. And uh, what I would try to encourage you to do is uh, look at the source that everyone else tells you is not worth your attention. If you want to find out about Jesus, study Jesus. If you're here today and your faith has been kind of wavering because the season that you're in right now is tough and you're tired, and when you plot out the trajectory of where things are going, it's not good for you. And what I would tell you is that don't make an assumption about God based on the assumptions about your future that you have for yourself or your experience of pain and disappointment. God has never been dishonest with us about that. He told us in this world these things will happen. But he told us that he is with us. And he told us he would never leave us. And he told us he will get us through all of these things. And when we look back, we'll have a story of grace and power to tell. So, Father, wherever we are on the, the scale today of, of where our faith is or how much we think we have, would you help us to step away from our own assumptions, the box that we have built for you, and would you help us fully, completely look to you? Let, we want you to show us who you are. Reveal to us your grace and your greatness, your power and your majesty your humility and your kindness. Show it all to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.